The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 46 Joseph On the pages of sacred history, Joseph stands prominent among the few characters of whom inspiration has recorded no faults. Joseph received one of the three portions of the birthright. It is interesting to note that each part of that birthright has been immortalized. Judah, in his home life, perfected such a character that the honor of being the progenitor of Christ was bestowed upon him. And before the throne of God in heaven, holy beings point to Christ and say, Behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Levi triumphed in the time of a great crisis in the cause of God and thus perfected a character which entitled him to the priesthood, whose work was a shadow of that of the great high priest in heaven. Joseph separated from his brethren, surrounded by idolaters in a strange land, gained a victory which entitled him to the double portion of the inheritance. Two portions of the promised land were given to the family of Joseph, and throughout eternity these two divisions of that distinct company, the 144,000, bearing the names, one of Joseph and the other of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, will be a reminder of his faithfulness. This was prophetically announced in the blessing given by his father. The blessings of thy father and of thy mother have prevailed beyond the blessings of the eternal mountains, beyond the glories of the everlasting hills. They shall rest upon the head of Joseph and upon the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brethren. Joseph was the eleventh son of Jacob and the firstborn of Rachel, the beloved wife. The first seventeen years of his life were spent with his father's household. The principal points recorded in the early life of Joseph were the great love of Jacob for the lad, the coat of many colors, Joseph's dreams, and his being sold into Egypt. There was evidently a marked significance to that coat of many colors. Joseph was not a child when given the coat, but a young man seventeen years of age, with an exemplary character. The old father knew that Reuben had forfeited his right to officiate as priest of the household, and as the patriarch watched the godly life of Joseph, it would be only natural that he should select him as the one worthy to fill the holy office. It is possible that in vision he may have been permitted to see the great heavenly priest, and that he made the code as a faint representation of the priestly robe to be worn by his descendants. But God sees not as man sees. From that group of envious, jealous sons, plotting murder in their hearts, the Lord took one, and purified and refined him, until his descendants were fitted to fill the holy office of the priesthood. The dreams of Joseph, revealing that the family would bow down before him, were more than the jealous hearts of the ten brothers could endure. Benjamin, the twelfth son, was but a child at this time. When Joseph came to his brothers in the field, at a distance from their father, it would seem that all but Reuben had murderous designs against him. Jewish tradition states that Simeon bound Joseph before they lowered him into the pit, designing that he should perish there. Otherwise he might have climbed out and escaped. When the dreams of Joseph's childhood were fulfilled, and his brothers bowed with their faces to the earth before him, then he remembered his dreams. May we not conclude that Joseph, when he commanded the officers to take Simeon and bind him before their eyes, remembered how Simeon once bound himself, unmindful of his cries for mercy, while these same men looked on without any pity for him? Simeon must also have remembered it, for Reuben had just reminded the brothers of their cruelty to Joseph. Joseph had no resentment in his heart. He could say to those men, It was not you that sent me hither, but God. Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Joseph saw only the Lord's hand in it all. When sold as a slave to Potiphar, 
he realized he was in God's hands. His faith took hold of God, and while serving Potiphar, the muscles of his hands were strengthened through the power of the mighty one of Jacob. The psalmist says, The word of the Lord tried him. He believed the word of God that had been taught him in childhood. It was that word which kept him courageous in prison and humble when ruling Egypt. His strength, both in adversity and in prosperity, came from the mighty God of Jacob. When considering the strict integrity of Joseph in the midst of Egyptian darkness, we must not forget that Rachel, his mother, lived until he was about sixteen years of age. After she had, by her godly instruction, fortified her son for the great life work before him, God in mercy laid Rachel to rest before Joseph was sold into Egypt, so she was spared that great sorrow. And throughout eternity she will see the fruit of her training, for it was no doubt his mother's godly instruction that enabled Joseph to connect with God so closely that his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The Septuagint translation of Genesis chapter 49 verse 26 joins the mother's name with the father's in the blessing. The blessings of thy father and thy mother, it has prevailed above the blessing of the lasting mountains and beyond the blessings of the everlasting hills. The dying patriarch, as he thought of the character of Joseph, remembered the years of faithful instruction which Rachel had given him from his birth until death separated them. The mothers of the other sons are not mentioned in the blessings. Happy the mother that gives, and thrice happy the child that receives such instruction. There is a power in godly training in childhood that molds the character. It places a diadem of grace on the head of the one who receives it. Joseph saw the hand of God in all the events of his life. Job manifested the same spirit, for after God had permitted the devil to take away all his earthly possessions, he left the devil out of the reckoning entirely, and said, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This spirit cherished in the heart today will make a man great. The same is in the days of Job and Joseph. The first years of Joseph's life in Egypt were passed in the house of Potiphar, who made him overseer of all his interests. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph's personal appearance is spoken of as goodly and well-favored. The wife of his master tried to entrap him, but his reply, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? showed his strict integrity, but it cost him his position. From a place of honor he was cast into prison. Again, God vindicated Joseph, and he was honored by being placed in charge of all the prisoners. He accepted his position in the prison as from the hand of the Lord. After several years of prison life, at the age of thirty, he stood before Pharaoh and interpreted the king's dreams but he was careful to attribute all the honor to God. Then he was exalted to the second place in the kingdom, where he taught the Egyptian senators wisdom. During the seven years of plenty, Joseph laid up large quantities of grain for use during the seven years of famine. He married an Egyptian wife, and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were born during these seven years of plenty. Joseph had been chief ruler in Egypt nine years when his brothers came to Egypt to buy food. It is interesting to note that when Joseph told his brothers that he would keep Benjamin as an hostage, he had the satisfaction of hearing Judah, the very one who years before had suggested selling Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, offer to become his bondman for life in place of Benjamin. Joseph had the privilege of sustaining his father and his brothers many years, and of seeing the fulfillment 
of his youthful dreams. During Joseph's long life of one hundred and ten years, we have no record of his ever proving untrue to God in any way. He died with a firm faith in the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His last words were, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. His body was embalmed, and when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they fulfilled his dying charge. When the voice of Christ shall call the sleeping saints from their dusty beds, Joseph will spring forth, clad in glorious immortality, to greet the shepherd, the stone of Israel, through faith in whom he gained all his victories. The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 47 Benjamin Benjamin, the twelfth son of Jacob, was left motherless at the time of his birth. The only recorded request of his mother, Rachel, was that the babe might be called Benani, the son of my sorrow. But Jacob changed the name to Benjamin, the son of the right hand. The tender love of the father for his motherless son is shown by his unwillingness to allow him to accompany his brethren into Egypt. Benjamin is often referred to as a lad when he went into Egypt, but the record states that he was the father of ten sons at that time. The patriarchal form of government, no doubt, brought him more closely under the direction of his father than our married sons of the present day. While little is recorded of Benjamin as an individual, the tribe which bore his name acted a prominent part in the history of the children of Israel. The character of the tribe seems to be portrayed by the prophetic words of Jacob in his parting blessing. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. These words do not describe an enviable character, but rather that of a child indulged and petted until it is self-willed and petulant, as one might expect the youngest son in a large family would be, with no mother to control him. The same stubborn spirit was shown by the tribe of Benjamin, fighting until they were nearly exterminated, rather than deliver up the wicked men of Gibeah, that they might be punished. Notwithstanding, they were at this time reduced in number to six hundred, yet in the time of David they had again become a numerous tribe. In the days of the judges, the Benjamites could furnish seven hundred men that could sling stones at a hairbreadth and not miss. About three hundred and fifty years later, we read that the mighty men of Benjamin could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow. The Benjamites were the only tribe which seemed to have pursued archery to any purpose, and their skill in the use of the bow and the sling was celebrated. Benjamin's territory lay north of Judah's, the boundary line between the two tribes running through the city of Jerusalem. After the great crisis, which resulted from the unfortunate transaction at Gibeah, there were many things that would have a tendency to change the stubborn, self-willed nature of the tribe. For twenty years the sacred ark of the Lord remained within their borders in kirjath Jerem, with a priest to take charge of it. Ramah, a city of Benjamin, was the home of Samuel, the prophet, who had an altar built unto the Lord in this place, and offered sacrifices. Samuel went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places, and his return was to Ramah. Mizpah, the place where the great assemblies of all Israel were held, was within the borders of Benjamin. Here the Lord wrought a mighty deliverance for his terrified people. The Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. The prophetic words of Moses in his parting blessing on the tribes indicated that there would be a decided change from the character portrayed by Jacob. Of Benjamin he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. 
the same fearless character that Jacob compared to a wolf, destroying everything before it, is changed by the converting power of the Spirit of God, and the strength once used to destroy is now used to protect the people and interests of the Lord. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. The same fearless character that Jacob compared to a wolf, destroying everything before it, is changed by the converting power of the Spirit of God, and the strength once used to destroy is now used to protect the people and interests of the Lord. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. It is interesting to notice the similarity between the character of the ancient tribe and that of the leading apostle to the Gentiles, who said of himself, I also am an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul, afterward called Paul, is first introduced to us as witnessing the stoning of Stephen and consenting unto his death. Next we hear of him as a ravening wolf, making havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, and committing them to prison. Like a savage wolf, thirsty for the blood of his prey, he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. There was no safety for any of the beloved of the Lord near such a character, but the same strength of character that will cause one to raven as a wolf and to hurt and destroy the people of God, will, when converted, shield and protect the honor of God and his cause. From that time that Saul the Benjamite had had one view of Jesus, his wolf-like nature departed, and the beloved of the Lord could dwell in safety by him. The saints at Damascus were in no danger. He, who had designed to destroy them, was now their friend, ready to protect them at any time. God never forgets to return an act of kindness. When Saul shielded and protected the beloved of the Lord, the Lord covered him all the day long. Nothing could harm him. The sting of the poisonous serpent was powerless. There was not enough water in the sea to drown him. God covered him all the day long. The blessing given by Moses says, The Lord shall cover him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Some commentators think that this refers to the temple being built on Mount Moriah, within the borders of Benjamin, but to the one who has childhood recollections of being carried between the strong shoulders of his father over the rough, uneven places in the road. The words have another meaning. The Lord shall cover him all the day long, protect from all harm and danger. And when we come to the impossibilities in our pathway, things which our strength could never master, our Heavenly Father lifts us in His mighty arms and carries us safely over that which without His help it would be utterly impossible for us to accomplish. Like the child resting securely between the shoulders of its father, with its arms clasped firmly around his neck, we accomplish that which is beyond all human power blessed place to be. But it is for the one by whom the beloved of the Lord can dwell in safety. The voice of criticism and slander must be forever hushed by the one who hopes to fill that place. Ehud, under whom the land had rest fourscore years, was a Benjamite. He was left-handed, and it seemed that by using his left hand he was able more adroitly to slay Eglon, king of Moab, who was oppressing Israel. Saul, the first king of Israel, was of the tribe of Benjamin. God not only anointed Saul king over Israel, but he gave him another heart. He had associated with him men whose hearts God had touched, and as long as he remained humble, the Lord was with him. When he became exalted in his own mind, he was rejected of the Lord. Then the wolf-like propensities in his character were clearly seen. For he, like a ravening wolf, for years chased David as a partridge in the mountains. His one desire was to slay the beloved of the Lord. 
in direct contrast with Saul, who spent the strength of his manhood in plotting to destroy the man after God's own heart, is Mordecai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Their fathers bore the same name, and they may have been related more closely than the tribal connection. The whole history of Mordecai is a series of deliverances of people from trouble. He saved the life of the Persian king. Afterwards, Satan and Haman planned to destroy every believer in the true God. And while Mordecai was earnestly seeking the Lord for deliverance, God used the kindness he had shown to the king as a means of escape. Mordecai was raised to an exalted position in the kingdom and was used by the Lord to shield and protect his people. The true lasting victory that extends throughout all eternity does not depend upon tribal connections or hereditary tendencies, but upon a humble trust in God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God can humble kings when they disregard his word, and he can take captives and give them kingly power. The natural character of Benjamin is the character of the unconverted heart in every age of the world. Happy the one at the present day who, like Mordecai, will stand true to principle and will risk all to protect the beloved of the Lord. He can claim the promise given to Benjamin of old. The Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Twelve thousand having this character, bearing the name of Benjamin, will serve the Lord day and night in his temple throughout eternity. The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 48 Manasseh A dying patriarch's blessing meant much in ancient times, and when Joseph heard that his father was sick, he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and visited him. After repeating to Joseph the promise of the land of Canaan, which had been given to Abraham and renewed to Isaac and Jacob, the old patriarch said, Thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. When Jacob saw the boys, he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Joseph placed the firstborn at Jacob's right hand and the youngest at his left. But the aged patriarch laid his right hand on the head of the younger, and his left hand upon the head of the eldest, as he blessed them. When Joseph saw it, he attempted to place Jacob's right hand on the head of Manasseh, the eldest, saying, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. But his father refused, saying, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. Like his great-uncle Esau, Manasseh, although the firstborn, received the second place in the blessing. But the circumstances were entirely different. Manasseh did nothing to forfeit his privileges in the family blessing, while he did not have the warlike propensities of Ephraim, which enabled him to build up the kingdom of Israel, yet Manasseh's name will outlive that of Ephraim. There was one portion of the patriarch's blessing which seemed to be shared more largely by Manasseh than by his more prosperous brother. The angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads. The blessing of the Lord was prized by Manasseh and his descendants. Although they lived at a distance from the center of the nation and from the temple, and though they had become a part of the northern kingdom, yet they took an interest in all the reforms instituted by the good kings of Judah. When King Asa broke down the idols and renewed the worship of the Lord, they came to him in abundance from Manasseh when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. When Hezekiah held his great Passover feast, representatives from Manasseh humbled their hearts and came and partook of the Passover. They also joined in the work of breaking down the images in their own territory. The work of reform in the days of Josiah was also carried to the land of Manasseh. 
They did not lose their interest in the temple at Jerusalem, but gave of their means to restore it after its defilement during the reigns of Manasseh and Ammon. It is supposed that the 80th Psalm was written by some inspired penman of the house of Joseph during one of these seasons of reform. Little is recorded of the tribe of Manasseh after the settlement into Canaan. But it is gratifying that faint and scattered as the passages are that refer to that tribe, they all indicate a desire on the part of many to serve the Lord. The blessing of the angel rested upon Manasseh, and while Ephraim and Manasseh were the names of the two portions given to Joseph in the earthly possession, the names given to the two divisions of the 144,000 in the kingdom of God will be Manasseh, Greek Manassas, and Joseph. The name of Manasseh is thus immortalized, while that of Ephraim sinks into oblivion. Gideon, the greatest of the judges, was of the tribe of Manasseh. He seems to have been the only great warrior in the western half of the tribe. The eastern portion were more warlike. When David went out with the Philistines to battle against Saul, warriors from Manasseh joined themselves to David. But when the lords of the Philistines would not allow David to go with them to battle, seven mighty warriors, captains of the thousands of Manasseh, joined David at Ziklag. They helped David against the band of rovers, who had carried captive David's family, for they were all mighty men of valor. After the death of Saul, 18,000 of the half-tribe of Manasseh were expressed by name to come and make David king at Hebron. The five daughters of Zelophehad of the tribe of Manasseh are the first women mentioned in the Bible as holding an inheritance in their own name and right. If Reuben had never lost his birthright through sin, if Reuben had never lost his birthright through sin, or if Dan had not formed a character so near akin to Satan that his name was omitted from the list of the twelve tribes, Manasseh's name might never have been given to one of the divisions of the 144,000. In all this experience are lessons for every child of God. When God says, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. It is well that we heed the admonition. If we do not, we may find, when too late, that we have allowed the world to rob us of our love for the Master, and that our judgment has become so darkened by sin and unbelief that, like Reuben, we fall far short of doing the work the Lord designed we should accomplish. Someone who, like Joseph, has been separated from those of the same faith without the opportunities we have enjoyed, will by simple faith and trust in God do the work we have failed to do and receive the reward we might have obtained. The pathway of time is strewn with the wrecks of character. Men who were once true and faithful members of the Israel of God and who were written to life in Jerusalem, but who allowed Satan to fill their hearts with envy and jealousy and criticism until, like Dan, they have lost their hold on heavenly things and are no longer numbered with the Israel of God. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown.